Riley is an award-winning health educator, professor, best-selling author, inspirational speaker, and TV host. She has her own TV shows. Um, they want her for her expertise in mindful, active, plant-based living. She's a celebrity chef. And uh, she travels all around the U.S. and even the world. I think she was in Bali in June or July giving presentations. So I just love that. It's great. Um, she's a consultant for one of my favorite organizations, the BCRM. Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. If you're not familiar with them, look them up. They do great work. They, they're science-based, um, which is great. We need, we need that too. Um, and uh, she, she basically is um, oh, she, uh, Colin Campbell program is where she she received her um, certificate from in plant-based nutrition, uh, Cornell University, I should say. Okay, enough about that. Does anybody know who, told, who turned the coin vegan? Nobody? <laughs> Donald Watson. Beautiful. You get a signed book. And if, if, yeah, and if you want your name on it, go see Lonnie afterwards and she'll give you a first line. here. I'm going to ask you, how many people here have ever 
experience stress eating. Okay. <laughs> Has anybody here ever uh, felt like you were mindlessly snacking? Okay. What, and look how brave you are. Everyone's raising their hands. <laughs> Um, what about anyone who felt like that you were kind of emotional eating or overeating and it was based on emotions? Okay, good. It's, you know, it's the first time I ever asked that question in a, a presentation and everybody raised their hands and start, started laughing. So it seems like it's a universal. Well, another way to put it is, see if you identify with this. Have you ever come home at the end of a busy day, you're tired, and before you know it, you're up to your wrist in a box of whatever that ever, <laughs> ever happened to you. Or maybe you sat down and had a lovely full meal, you're fully satisfied, and about half an hour later, you're kind of snarfing through the refrigerator to find the thing that's going to make it just right. And I think there's some, some identification here. Because what I described to you is what used to be me. I have a long and colorful diet history. I had 30 years of going up and down with my weight, coming and going from diets and under eating and overeating. And all during that time, I finally felt that I must be addicted to sweets. I thought I was a horrible emotional eater and that maybe I was even addicted to food. And I found out that even though I knew plenty of what to do, I have an advanced degree in physical education. I teach kinesiology up at a college in the North State. So I knew all about the exercise, right? Uh, I was skilled and trained in plant-based nutrition, having been a vegetarian starting mm, 45 years ago. So I knew what the foods to eat, but I could not make the connection with how to make it work. It wasn't until 25 years ago when I took a <coughs> mindfulness practice that I was able to find the linchpin that brought these things together for me. So what we're going to talk about today <laughs> is in, in, that the connection between stress responses and our behaviors and where mindfulness might come in. Now, I want to make it clear that mindfulness, I started with a definition earlier, I'm going to repeat it and add to it. Mindfulness is a specific form of mental training and a particular kind of attention you bring to your daily activities. This leads to reductions of reactivity wherever that shows up in your life and cultivation of positive brain states. Here's another way to look at it. Your mind, hi, is what your brain does and what you do with your mind shapes your brain. So with mindfulness practice, you're doing little things with your mind that lead to big changes in your brain and your experience of living. Sound interesting? Okay, actually, so think about it. The real truth about mindfulness is if you can get home at the end of a busy day and settle into peace and quiet and calm, if you can be at ease in the middle of rush hour traffic, if you can have unconditional love for everybody, then you're probably a dog. <laughs> so, my, my point here is that a mindfulness practice does not take away the stresses and, and the ups and downs of life, but it gives you new tools for navigating them because of these changes it makes in our brain. How's that? Yeah, I want to be mindful, but not now. <laughs> Who wants to be here now? No, it's okay. Yeah. So this is part of the definition that I gave you. My publisher just put together these beautiful graphics from um, the book. What's this? Thank you. It's a canary in a coal mine. Very important point here. I've ex told you what the canary in my coal mine has been hysterically. It was food, the eating, the relationship with my body, all of that. That is where stress response played out for me. Other people will play out that stress response through maybe obsession with can't get away from work, overproductivity. Some people might be obsessed with a diet or exercise program. Um, maybe some other substance abuse might come into play. But every one of us has a way of playing out some of these anxieties, uh, zoning out online. Some of them may seem more destructive than others or constructive than others, but they all have the commonality of human misery behind them. I bet everyone in here knows somebody who's overproductive at work, gets all kinds of public support and, and professional support for that, but they're really in angst. Have you ever known someone like that? It's a little bit of a conflict. 
So I want you to relate to this, even as I tell and talk about some of the food issues that are directly related to me. That's just the canary in my coal mine. And the mindfulness practices relate to every single canary situation. All right? Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. So let's find out why we have these stress responses. Can't we all relate to this? You know, aren't dogs just a, a model of mindfulness? I'm here on the park bench, and it's so lovely. And what what happens with us? Actually, it's more like, <laughs> well, I've ever felt like this. And even though we may have many tasks and things to do on our plate, did you know that actually a great deal of our time, our minds are wandering? <laughs> A study was conducted in the last few years from at Harvard University, and they wanted to find out what the correlation was between our mood states and wandering mind. Does anyone here do, do, does mind doesn't wander? Maybe you can tell us about. It. <laughs> Everyone seems to relate to that. Here's how they constructed the research. They gave over 5,000 people a phone with an app on it. And these people, <laughs> I know, see somebody. They, these people were aged 18 to 80, they were from 80 different occupations, they were from countries all over the world, so it was a pretty broad, broad choice of people. And uh, what happened with the app is they were pinged several times during the day, and they were resp to respond to three questions. What are you doing? What are you thinking about? And what's your mood state? What's your level of happiness? What are you thinking? What are you thinking about? And what's your state of happiness? So what they found out two very important results from this. One is that we are spending at least 50% of our time in wandering mind state. And most of that is either flashing back to the past, previous experiences, thinking about something happened previously, Coulda, woulda, shoulda. Why did I say that to that person? How could I have done that differently? And this is not, not the same as reflecting on your actions to make a better choice in the future. We know the difference, right, between can't get it out of my mind and that feeling that comes along with that. And the other half of this wandering mind time is spent projecting into the future. What do you think? catastrophizing, imagining the worst, imagining several scenarios. Again, this is not the same as planning a trip or preparing for your job interview. It's over and over chewing and chewing. So half the time they found was spent wandering mind into these two areas. That's one part they found. The other thing they discovered, Remember, they had to say what I'm doing, what I'm thinking about, and what my mood state is. They found, without exception, that people who were focused on what they were doing, that's another way of saying being in the present, doing what you're doing, were happier than people whose minds were wandering, even if they were doing something they didn't want to do. So, for example, let's say you're doing the dishes. You don't like doing the dishes, and you'd rather be fantasizing about last summer in Hawaii or next summer, you know, on the camping trip, that your mood state is actually higher if you are simply present in the present moment doing what you're doing. Very instructive. Now this goes to another level. Are you with me so far? You got the results of the research? Okay, so. Our ability to take our minds sat back and forth, it comes at an emotional cost. And here's the problem with this. The researchers have now taken from this study and gone further. And we know that wandering mind, when we have no, no degree of skill over mastery over how much our mind is wandering from the present moment, and if we haven't had training in it, that's the most of us moves us into a part of the brain called the default mode network, called the DMN for short. By the way, this is all in the book. It's heavily researched. I'm an academic, so I've got like 300 references in there to all of this stuff. So 
lots more than I have time to tell you about now. But, so we're residing in this default mode network. So what's wrong with that, right? So I'm wandering mine, even though we just heard that it can affect your mood state. Here's what happens. If being in the default mode network deteriorates into excessive rumination, does that make sense to you? Excessive meaning too much? Rumination is, you ever had that? I can't get it out of my head. I wish I could stop thinking about that. Once that happens, you actually hook neural activity in the brain where also reside sadness, depression, cravings, anxiety, obsession, all those fun things that we really enjoy experiencing. So the point here is if we're not getting some degree of mastery over this tendency of our minds when unwatched to just go all over the place, <coughs> is it any wonder then that we're experiencing some of these bits of human misery that we've just talked about, obsessions, cravings, addictions, all of those things, because they're in that part of the brain. Stay with me? That makes sense? All right. So here's what happens. Here's how mindfulness practices address that. And um, hopefully, yes, we are going to have time to do some practice together because I really like to do in the moment what it's like to do. It keeps your mind from getting lost in the past or future. So that you start to get some degree of mastery over, okay, I'm going to be, my mind is here wandering and I know that that's happening. Instead of just discovering hours later that you're kind of sad or that you're zoned out online. And whenever, you know, <laughs> and that's something I want to connect to. Have you ever had the feeling of when you start to go through some social media, and you know how compelling it is, right? It just pulls you in. Do you know it's based on distraction? It's based on, let's get this mind to wander to where I want to take it. And I've noticed that if I spend an enor any amount of time, I start to feel kind of a sadness. And I, you know, you want to put it down, but you, it keeps picking you up because you get those little dopamine hits from every little you know, thing. But that's, I, that's kind of like wandering mind with tech support. That's how I see it. So I think that's important for us to look at in our day and age. And you can counteract automaticity and reactivity, and it will pull you out of the de default mode network into the present moment. Now remember at the very beginning when I gave the definition of mindfulness, is it reduces reactivity and cultivates positive brain states. Reactivity and automaticity can be helpful to us when we need to pull our hand off the burning fire or swerve out of danger and traffic. But how much of our reactivity in the day is emotional or response to another person or, an, or another thing and we just have this negative response whether it's a skillful or beneficial. When you start to not having this, your mind is taking off wherever it wants to go all the time, you start to be able to live more skillfully because you can see this happening and you can make choices. You see the quote I had at the very beginning from Viktor Frankl. I'm going to repeat it because it's entirely pertinent to this. Between stimulus and response, there's a space. And in that space, you have a choice. And in that choice lies your freedom. Actually, that's the title of the first chapter in the Mindful Vegan is Freedom. This is directly pertinent to my, the canary in my coal mine because my react form of reactivity and automaticity was through food, through controlling it, through indulging in it one way or the other. It was difficult for me to navigate emotions or a disquieting states. That was kind of how I, I dealt with it. And when I learned to see that connection and not be automatic in that behavior, my life changed. I actually dropped 40 to 50 pounds that I, from, that I had like what, 20 years ago that has not come back. And it's, I'm not saying pick this up as a weight loss tool, but I'm saying there is a real reflection there. And it restored the pure joy of eating it removed my mind from the obsession of making that my refuge. You know how we take refuge in these behaviors that really just kind of get circuitous for us. 
So these are just two really important um, fundamentals of mindfulness practice. <laughs> Have you ever felt like that? <laughs> you know those little monkey toys are clapping their hand? Again, the point is that, you know, a wandering mind, it has its place in our evolution. We need to be on alert so we can designate the snakes from the sticks and look out for danger. And it's not like that's a bad thing. But it has taken over our reality to a great degree in a way that's causing us a great degree of misery. So mindfulness practice doesn't make these thoughts go away, but it gives you that little bit of space so that you're not so reactive to everything, and you don't have to be jerked around by everything that comes into your head. That's, that's human misery for me. So, I wanted to share with you about a couple research studies. There are thousands of research studies out about the benefits of mindfulness practice. Anybody read some of them? You see them coming in in the news? Tremendous amount, and it's because, largely due to the work of John Kabat-Zinn, who's written many books on mindfulness. Some of you probably have his books. He's really pioneered the mindfulness movement in our country and kind of westernized it for us. But because of his work and bringing it into health settings and hospitals, mindfulness training and practices are in hospitals all over the country now. Do you know that? It's a science. It's not based on religion. It's non-sectarian. You don't have to believe anything. You just kind of try it out and learn how the brain works in this fashion. One of the studies, or several studies, have actually been done on a binge eating. And taking two groups, one group through the standard cognitive behavior in intervention, like avoid triggers, um, you know, journal your food, stick to healthy food, get support, those kinds of things. And the other group, there's a control group. These were all people who were troubled by binge eating, whether they were overweight or not. It was still a problem for them. And the other group got mindfulness training practice, which means they were instructed, just as we will do in a little bit, about how to actually get beneath the surface of all this activity in the mind, how to get some degree of mastery over our reactivity to it, and also how to move this practice into your day so that you're actually more mindful throughout the day and not so getting lost in the default mode network, you know, doing what you're doing while you're doing it. Um, and those who did the mindfulness group were more successful at cessation of binge eating to a large degree, statistically significant, and there are actually several studies like this now. I have more t details in the book. I'm just giving you a hint now because of our time limitations. Perhaps the most dramatic research that I love to address is one with smoking. Now, whether you think food and eating is an addiction, I have my own opinions about that, but that's a whole other hours and hours I could be talking about. I just did a video about that on, on YouTube this week, by the way, if you're interested. But we all know that smoking is an addiction, right? That's not up for debate. Well, get this. This was done at Yale by Judson Brewer and some of his team. They took one group and took them through the American Lung Association gold standard, the Freedom from Smoking program. Avoid triggers, substitute something else when you want to smoke, chew carrots, sunflower seeds, donuts, you know, kind of a replacement like that. Um, do some kind of relaxation, look at your relationships, all those standards that go with that. There was a mindfulness group that was given a certain degree of mindfulness practice every day. Uh, it was sometimes it was just like five or ten minutes. They were trained in how to move this formal practice into informal practice, which is how to be more present and mindful through the rest of your day. They learned how to manage that craving cycle with mindfulness practice. This applies to food too, not by replacing it with something else, which basically just keeps the craving loop going. It doesn't end it. They learned to navigate what's going on in your body and your mind when you experience a craving. And I teach both the, that, I also teach that practice in the book about how to find out what's going on in your body that tells you, gives you information about your emotions and your reactions. And you think about it, craving, anyone ever had, ever not had a craving? <laughs> and everyone raised their hands early when I said, have you had it? And it's possible that someone has not. 
But I know from my experience, there's an actual physical feeling that goes with it. There's like, I almost like I'm, I'm leaning, because that's how it feels like you're reaching out, you're leaning forward, there's kind of an agitation. You know what I'm talking about? Think back to the time when you created, and you just, something had to be satisfied or broken. So with the mindfulness practice, you start to learn about these responses in our body that give you information about what you're experiencing, and you can walk through that door to navigate them in a whole new way instead of pushing them away, suppressing them, replacing them with a carrot or a sunflower seed. <laughs> Um, you dissolve it. And that's what happened for me with food and eating. First I had to make sure I was eating enough, and that's a whole other topic um, on the food addiction like I told you about earlier. But also learning to be present with any of these disquieting states that we have instead of reacting to them. This is where our peace lies. You learn that you don't have to actually identify with every one of these mood states that come along. So what do you think the results were of the smoking cessation program? One group mindfulness, one group um, freedom from smoking. 17 weeks post-treatment, those in the mindfulness training group were twice as successful as smoking cessation. <clears throat> These were all people who smoked at least, I think, 20 cigarettes a day, re desired letting go of smoking and giving it up. But that's pretty dramatic, twice as effective. So the meditators, through their formal practices and learning how to put it into active living as well, learned how to navigate those cravings. They learned how to not be reactive to them, all because they learned this technique of getting in beneath all this wild activity of the mind. Is that exciting or what? Yes. So back to meditation a little bit, because we're about to go into some practice I would like to do a few minutes together. And I want you to know, going in, um, in the book, The Mindful Vegan, I have this set up as a 30-day plan for finding health, balance, peace, and happiness. And the reason I set it up for a 30-day plan is because I want you to try this on and see if it is something that is beneficial for you. So every single day, I have a lesson in mindfulness practice. I bring in some research. I teach you exactly what to do for the day. Day one, one minute. <laughs> And you build from there, so it's really accessible. I've also just finished recording 30 tracks of audio support, one for every single day, and those are free on my website. It tells you when you're ready to go to get it. They're up and ready. So if you buy them today, it's yours. And I will tell you more about it at the end. Remind me about that, and I want to tell you about the virtual retreat coming up. Can you guys help me out? Okay. Um, meditation. Now, we had, it's, it's looked like we had several people who do mindfulness meditation or some other form of meditation. This is kind of our vision of it, right? You know, it's quiet and peaceful and you have know, this beautiful inner and outer view. When actuality, it's more like... <laughs> have, this is the problem. You know, we sit down, have you ever had this challenge? You sit down to try this meditation thing and this is what happens? Well, guess what? This is what's always going on. We're just not aware of it until we sit down and seek to do otherwise. I won't leave that there, it'll distract us. <laughs> I also want to make it clear before we do just a couple minutes of practice together is that mindfulness practice, as I said earlier, it doesn't give you a trouble free world, it doesn't stop your thoughts. People say, I just can't quiet my mind. I just can't quiet my mind. Well, that's because our mind's job is to think and be active and do all these things. What it teaches you is to not be so reactive and distracted by all of the thinking. And the more you practice, the more you are able to be into this place where you can see this going on, but it's like a train coming along the tracks, and you can either hop on the train or you can just kind of let it go by. This then gives you some tools for moving through the rest of your day. Would it not be nice if in all of our life encounters and situations, every kind of thought that comes along, every piece of reactivity we're feeling, we don't feel like we need to hop on and find ourselves hours later still thinking about the same thing? Does that appeal? 
What I'd like to do is teach you and sit with you in silent meditation just for a couple minutes. Day two is two minutes. And I'm going to teach exactly what I do for structuring this in the book because it sets, I also taught sixth grade for 20 years. <laughs> so, I, and Greg didn't mention that, I don't think it's in my bio, but I'm, I'm skilled and trained in taking what could be like a complex project <coughs> or problem and breaking it down to step-by-step -step pieces. And so by doing this, I set it up so every day you go through four simple steps to get your body in position. And I want to underscore that I really believe that to be able to bring this non-reactivity and more being present in the moment through the rest of our day, it's going to demand those moments of formal practice. It's just like anything. You know, you can't become a good tennis player unless you practice tennis. You can't be a good anything unless you put time in and practice. So for me, underscoring the value of this is tremendous. So shall we? Just where you are, and people standing, by the way, you can meditate, lying down, sitting, folded legs, standing, walking, and actually active uh, mindfulness is moving through your day. We just have in our mind that it's somebody sitting with their legs folded and crossed because many of the cultures from which mindfulness is devised, the people in that culture tend to be floor sitters and leg crosses, right? We're chair sitters. There's no reason that this can't be adapted to what is available for you. So I'm going to be a little bit lower than the back um, row because I want to do this with you. So I set this up doing formal practice in the step, four steps that I call pair. P stands for position, and we're all either sitting or standing. So for those of us in a chair, you want to be um, upright. You can have your low back against the chair. That's fine. A dignified position, and yet at ease. Meditation is, um, the, it can't be forced, it can't be tried. Remember, I already told you your mind's not going to go quiet on you. It's a way of navigating that disquietude. So your body is upright, dignified, and at ease. That's position, <coughs> feet on the floor. And you can have your hands folded in your lap, on the arms of the chair. I put them here because it's a position I do nothing else with. You know, having my legs <coughs> on my legs, so it kind of reminds me, it brings me in, into the place. Second is anchor kind of like a, you know, anchor on a boat. I'm betting everybody here has heard about mindfulness practice and using the breath, focusing on the breath. Do you know why that is? Anyone have an idea? Breath is connected to the mind. Breath is connected to the mind. It's true. When we get emotionally upset, we, I'm going to stand for just a couple minutes, though. So. Um, you know how our breathing changes when we're emotional. Well, guess what? Here's the real reason. <laughs> Breathing takes place in the present moment. You can't breathe for yesterday, and you can't breathe for tomorrow, right? So this is the point of bringing your anchor to the breath, and it's not counting the breath, it's not thinking about the breath, it's actually feeling it. So even before we close our eyes, can you become aware of maybe a little bit, what does it feel like when the breath comes in your nose and out, can you feel it? And if you can't, that's okay. It just means we have to keep looking a little closer. I can feel a little cool coming in here and a little warmth going down. But the mind is what you, to help us train this way. You want to keep bringing, build concentration by bringing your attention back to that feet. So that's anger. Step three is intention. That means set the intention. How long are you going to do this practice today? Is it one minute? Is it 20 minutes? Is it... 12 minutes. Without, if you leave that open for negotiation at the start, it's too easy to get a little distracted and go, eh, you know. <laughs> so you set the intention, and there's another really important part that goes with intention also. And that is the intention of bringing kindness, patience, equanimity, non judgment to the experience. Maybe you have tried to do this practice in the past. And your mind would wander, you'd go, oh, you know, there I go again, I'll never get this mindfulness thing, I'll never learn to meditate. Well, guess what? You're practicing judgment, anger, all of those qualities of decreasing that natural equanimity we have, equanimity of half, equanimity, and what you practice grows stronger. So does that make sense to you? 
So you start to observe how judgmental you are of yourself. And this is where you start to open up your natural compassion for you as well as everyone else. And we're on step three now, right? We did position, anchor, and intention. And this is a perfect place to also share with you. Notice how I just said your natural capacity for compassion and equanimity. These states, love, caring, compassion, kindness, are endogenous to us. It's just that we've gotten so good at keeping all this other mental activity on it. So what you're doing with your practice is unmining those states and learning how to be more present with this. This moves forward with you into your day and also for those of you who have challenges in navigating conversations with others about your lifestyle choices, <laughs> like what you eat and what you wear, you know, that's a, a kind of an ongoing point of contention for many of us. One of the reasons I wrote The Mindful Vegan was also to help us navigate those conversations with more equanimity. Be more present with those people. Be more compassionate with even that person next to you who's, you know, hauling into a big state and it just offends every one of your sensibilities. How can you navigate that more skillfully? The mindfulness practice will give you those tools, and I have several chapters actually devoted to that idea, or several sections devoted to that idea. So it's for reactive behaviors and also reactions to other people. And one more thing before I give you step four. One of my interviews for this book was with Dr. Dean Ornish, right here in UCSF. Everyone knows Dr. Ornish, correct? Yeah. Uh, and when I was writing the book, he was very gracious to me, invited me into his office, we spent a bunch of time, he gave me all these books of his, and one of them focused on meditation. Did you know that he's a meditator? <coughs> that he's been meditating about as long as I have. He started in 1970, mumble, mumble, back with those of us who <coughs> dove into it about then. But if you know anything about the, his reversal of heart disease program, he doesn't say it's just about the food, does he? He says it's about the food, it's about stress reduction, it's about exercise, it's about compassion, it's about loving relationships. And this is one thing I just love about Dr. Ornish, because he's got, he sees the holistic. Oh, by the way, on Amazon, I just noticed the Mindful Vegan jumped up to number one in holistic medicine. I didn't even know there was a category, but I connected with that because of what he presented to me. And Day 30 in the book is devoted to our interview because there were so many gems from our conversation. He said, I am so glad you're writing a book about meditation. And I'm so glad that you're telling people that this equanimity and peace and compassion is not something that they have to get outside themselves, like a new form of value or something. <coughs> it's within us and it's simply a matter of uncovering it. So step four, the R stands for Remindfulness, which means every time you remember that, oh yeah, I'm doing meditation <laughs> practice, even if you've been off thinking about something for 10 minutes, every time you remember it, you return to the anchor point, and then you repeat that as long as it takes for your intended time of sitting. That, my friends, is the essence of mindfulness practice. Not clearing the mind, not, I don't think about this, I don't think about not judging yourself about where your mind is going. It's about returning because that's how you train your brain. You see how that works? You make those little changes in your brain by what you do with your mind. So you ready to sit for a minute? Okay. What are you up for? Two minutes? One minute? Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, we'll go with that. So what we're going to do is everyone's going to be in position, which is upright at ease and yet also with dignity. If you're at the, at the standing and you don't want to fall over and you want to lean against the wall, we're in full support of that. Um, and let yourself first close your eyes and bring yourself right here into the present moment. And that can be, it's, it's nothing fancy, it's just can you feel your feet on the floor? Can you feel your backyard on the chair under which you're sitting? Can you feel your hands on your lap? Can you feel if your body right now is holding any tension? Is your face relaxed? Are your shoulders up by your ears? Just bringing awareness to what's happening right now. That's our position. Now bring our attention to the anchor. Come right to that area right below your nostrils where the breath passes over 
in and out as you breathe. See how closely you can pay attention to each single breath. Can you make it so that not a single breath during our minute goes by without you being fully aware of the feeling of the breath? We're setting our intention for two minutes, and every time your mind wanders, <clears throat> remindfulness steps in. Every time you remember you're sitting for practice, you return to the anchor point, and just repeat that. So let's begin. I was saying, okay, four steps, teachers do this, 
is, okay, you have to, once you remember, you remind yourself, and then you repeat. And I thought, that's like the three R's. Oh, it's like one word, remind plus. Well, thank you. Very nice. Well, I promised to tell you a little bit more about the, um, there's bonus gifts for pre-orders, and guess what? If you buy a book today, it's still not published until October 10th, so you're still in the pre-order zone. How does that work for you? Or if you end up going home and, um, you know, doing Amazon online or something. But I have bonus gifts to get people started. I, I, are you getting that about me? I say, let's do this thing. That's why I did a 30-day plan. I didn't want people to get a book and say, this is a great idea. Someday I'll do this. So to support right now is, uh, this is uh, on my website, there's the address, bit.ly mindful vegan, vegan bonus, and I have one of the audios up there, day four is already recorded, I have a four minute restorative yoga video, and I also have your ticket to the mindful vegan retreat. So all you have to do is if you go to this page, if you pre-order like on Amazon, you know how you get an order number? You're supposed to enter that in with your email. Well, if you buy your book here, just hashtag SF. That's your book receipt number. So more about the mindfulness retreat is it's actually on, I'm going to start it on October 19th. And once you sign up there, you will get an email um, regarding, you know, how we're going to be. It's, you don't even have to be there because it's going to be recorded. It'll be on webcast and telephone. Half an hour the first day to get you started and answer questions. And then on day four, come back in. And I, prom I told you I already have audios up for every single of 30 days. Here's the page. In the book, it tells you exactly how to navigate to this page. See all the, there they are. They're ready to go to support your practice. Yes. The book is $17.95 cash, and then if you pay a check, uh, it's a little, you know, the tax thing comes in. And I'm going to be right out there signing books, so I'm happy to meet all of you, and I know we need to let lovely AJ step in and get set up. Bye. Yes.